So we were looking at some of the properties of water. We looked at the, the properties of conduction. Now let us look at another very, very interesting property of water. In fact, many liquids doesn't have this particular property. It is called the anomalous expansion of water. If you look at all many of the materials which is there on this planet, what really happens is that as and when you cool down the material, its density goes on increasing, right? Why? Because it contracts. It keeps on contracting and then uh, so initially probably it's in liquid state and then it contracts and it and at some point it, it changes to solid state and at that point it further contracts. So which basically means the volume that it occupies keeps on reducing because of the contraction and its density keeps on increasing. So what is it? What is the real property? So for typically materials as they cool down as they cool down they contract and that leads to contraction leads to lesser volume and lesser volume leads to higher density So that is what really happens usually when materials cool down. But look at what happens to water. In the case of water, what happens is that, of course, this happens. So water is in liquid state. So water is liquid. So as in when you cool first, right? So assume that it was in 30 degrees centigrade, the room temperature, and we keep on cooling it up to 4 degree centigrade it contracts then from 4 degree to 0 degree it expands where you really expect it to contract like what other materials do when it cools down it contracts always right here there is this interesting liquid called water where it cools when it cools down up to 4 degree contracts from 4 to 0 degree it expands and this is what is anomalous expansion. Why is anomalous? It is an anomaly. It is against the normal. Right? This is against the normal. This is now this is not typically what you expect of materials. We expect the materials to contract as it cools down but in the case of water up to 4 degree it, it contracts. So the densest water, the densest water is at 4 degree. But from 4 degree when it goes to 3 degree it, it expands a little and 2 degree it expands a little, 1 degree it expands even more and 0 when it becomes solid it expands a little more and that is why and that is why the ice is less denser than water. So that's why ice is floating. Right? And this this leads to floating of ice. Why? Because ice is less 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 denser than In fact, you know, this behavior is so good. It is extremely good uh, for living conditions in the planet because very often what happens is that, assume that, uh, now this is a cross section of a river. Assume this is a cross section of a river. So you have, you have water all over, right? And this is a surface. Now what happens is that initially the surface starts cooling, it becomes ice. And the ice, so the the thing is that ice is denser. It is not heavier. If assume that it's a typical situation, ice would have been heavier and it would have gone down. Right? But that doesn't happen. It floats. And so what happens is that it, there is a layer of ice, but below that, the water will still be flowing. 
and the fishes and all that which are there inside can easily survive without any problem. If it was the other way where there was no anomalous expansion, the ice would have sunk down and the solidification of water would have happened bottom up. Right? The ice will keep on sinking down and down and down and ultimately the river will be fully full of ice. But here what happens is ice covers and you should also think there's another thing which ice does. Ice is a bad conductor of heat. Why? Because of the, all the trapped air uh, air uh, tra trapped air bubbles inside the ice. Ice is a bad conductor. This is something which I have discussed in uh, heat. So ice is a bad conductor. So ice will also help to keep the heat to the water. So water stops losing heat to the outside atmosphere because this will actually the ice will also form like a blanket about water. So see, beautiful, right? So the nature, how what this interesting property of water leads to a lot of possibilities within nature and so now the ice forms like a blanket over the, over the river and down below the water will still keep on flowing and water will not lose heat anymore because the ice will also act as a bad conductor a blanket over it and so that helps for the fishes and all the living organisms which is there in the river to live peacefully without any problems because as soon as the whole thing becomes ice they just can survive same thing happens in seas and oceans if you look at Arctic and Antarctic. So such a and this particular behavior of water is very interesting behavior. And there are there are also explanations which can be given on why uh, it's so, but that requires us to delve a little more deeper into the chemistry of water, which we'll be doing later, right? Uh, not probably in seventh standard, probably in the high school. Um, and but this property is such a very useful property. I just want to quickly show you a small video uh, here. Now here you can see this is a Niagara uh, River Ice Bridge. Actually, this is some this is near the Niagara Waterfall, also which is pretty famous in uh, in United States. And you can see what is happening. This is a river. And above the river, here you can see the ice is floating above it. You feel that this is as if, you know, it's full of ice. No, it is only a blanket of ice, a layer of ice. Below that, the river is still flowing. And that is why you see the water here. The river is flowing out. You can see here also, water. So below this ice, ice layer, there is water below. And the reason why that's happening is because ice is less denser than water. So it floats and forms a blanket above water. But down below the water is still flowing. So you can see here, uh, this property, the anomalous expansion of water, how it is aiding the liver, uh, river to be still flowing down under the ice and the fissures and all those things to still survive without any problems. Interesting property. Right? Don't you think so? And so that is what is anomalous expansion. I just want to quickly go through the uh, go through the slides. Right? So usually solids, liquids, gases contracts when cool and expands when heated. In the case of water, on cooling it contracts till it reaches four degrees centigrade, right? and beyond that it expands from four to zero degrees. So this is what is the anomalous. This is what is sorry. This is what is the anomalous expansion. This is anomalous expansion. From 4 degree, when it cools to 0 degree, it expands and its density increases. And it, this is what is called the anomalous expansion of water. Hence, ice has a lower density than water. And we saw that in that video also, how the ice is floating above the river. And you can see that also in Arctic and Antarctic oceans and seas, right? Where the ice is floating above and down below the sea or down below this river. That happens also for lakes for ponds, everywhere this is what happens, right? So you, you will never see a situation where the whole thing is converted to ice because then this ice forms a blanket as I told you, it's a very bad conductor of heat and then that will prevent the, the water below to lose more heat, right? Because this is like a blanket above it. Why ice is a bad conductor? First of all, water is a bad conductor of heat. So because of the ice is also a bad conductor. Over and above, inside ice there will be a lot of those air, um, air bubbles right inside and air as you know is even a worse 
conductor of heat than water. And so altogether it becomes a very bad conductor of heat. And that helps the water below the ice to not lose heat anymore. Right? So just like how you put the woolen blanket above you and the, that sees that the body heat is retained with them. Same thing, same concept as in the igloo also that we see. So please look at my heat uh, videos, you'll get to know more about it. Alright, so this is about anom anomalous expansion of water, another very interesting property of water. So we have seen the conductivity of water, we now you are seeing another very interesting property of water called the anomalous expansion of water. Right? Okay, now uh, let's go forward. Now, the other very, very interesting property of water is what is called the universal solvent. What is the universal solvent? This is something which I discussed right in the beginning. It is something which can dissolve many materials. It can dissolve almost most of the acids, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, all these dissolves in water. Many bases, there and the bases which can dissolve in water are called alkali, right? Just want to write it down. So, bases which are soluble in water are called alkali. alkali. So the, the bases which can dissolve in water are called alkali. For example, sodium hydroxide right is an al alkali potassium hydroxide is an alkali so a lot of these kind of bases which can dissolve in water right so they are called um, they are alkali right whereas calcium hydroxide in fact is not an alkali it cannot dissolve in water it precipitates right so uh, it depends all right now let me just uh, just clear this all right so uh, so it is a universal solvent because it's called a universal solvent because it can dissolve many substances. It can also dissolve many salts, right? Chlorides, uh, sulfates, nitrates, many of these uh, salts can also dissolve in water, right? And what happens to many of these uh, uh, salts is that they ionize and we have seen that leads to making the water a good conductor of uh, electricity as we have seen in the video before right so um, uh, so the pure water uh, which is the uh, what you call the distilled water is a bad conductor of uh, electricity but as soon as we added some salt the common salt the sodium chloride into it, it started conducting because it ionizes uh, completely inside water so, because it's a universal solvent and it can dissolve many materials, it usually acts as a medium in chemical reactions. And that is what I talked about the metabolic reactions, right? The metabolic reactions which happens within your body, the digestion, for example, or the reactions which happens in the cells which leads to production of heat or energy, uh, production of energy, right? Uh, again, all these are reactions which basically, uh, and these reactions happen in water. So water becomes a medium, the different uh, reactants which are going to react can dissolve in water and then in the water, in the presence of water can uh, combine to form um, other compounds and so on, right? So water is a very common medium, even in industry, water is a very important, um, uh, you know, solvent uh, because many reactions happen in the presence of water, right? So that is why water is called a universal solvent. Now, what about hardness? I'm sure that you have heard this word. Oh, that area, water is hard water, not good, right? Why people say that? What is hard water? And why, why water becomes hard? Is this a question that you've asked before? I'm sure you would have. Probably you also know the answer, right? But at a very simple term, the classification of a water is supposed to be soft water or hard water based on whether the uh, soap forms a lather, right? Lather is what? The form. When you are taking bath and when you apply soap, what happens? You get the soap form, the bubbles, right? 
Now, if you are actually doing that in hard water, you will find that the soap doesn't form that form. Many places when you are actually getting water from the tube well, that will be hard water and if you directly use that uh, for taking bath or want to wash vessels and so on, you can see that the soap doesn't form the form. So that is what, or the lather. This form is something, but it's also called the lather, right? So water which does not lather east readily with soap is called a hard water and the water which easily lathers with soap is called soft water. I just want to quickly show that uh, in a video, right, and uh, um, see the difference between the soft and the hard water. This lady is going to show that. So this is a soap solution, right? Now let us see uh, what happens when she takes some soft water and hard water and she's going to show the difference, right? So this is some dish soap, right, and she has taken some uh, bottle. Now she is taking water. This is soft water because this is treated water. Um, and so, uh, and you can see she has taken a little bit of water here. And she is pouring some soap. And she will shake the bottle now. And as soon as she shakes, you can see that the, the water is forming lather. The soap is forming lather, right? So, see, you can see the lather which is being formed. Whereas, see, this is hard water. And in hard water, you can see that it forms a milky-like color after soap is added. But there's no lather. Do you see any lather here? You don't see any lather at all. And so, this is hard water, right? Whereas, the water she showed just before, where she shook, uh, and you saw that the soap was, uh, it was forming lather out of form bubbles right and that is soft water and here so a very simple way of testing whether water is a hard water or soft water is just adding a little bit of, so of soap which could be washing powder right or a little bit of soap or soap solution into it and just shake and in the inside a bottle and see whether it forms a lather or not if it doesn't form lather that means water is hard water if it forms um, now if, if it, it forms lather very easily that means it's soft water Okay, so that's a simple test of testing hardness of water. All right, now let us go forward here. So that is a simple test of hardness. Now, what causes hardness? Why does water? Uh, why is the water called hard water? The reason why it is called hard water is because see, the water should have some minerals, but if it has excessive amount of mineral salts, then that will make it hard right so here for example dissolved salts of calcium and magnesium the calcium sulfate calcium so this is calcium sulfate I know you know the names of this, this is calcium sulfate right this is calcium bicarbonate HCO3 this is bicarbonate calcium bicarbonate this is magnesium sulfate magnesium bicarbonate calcium chloride and magnesium chloride so sulfates bicarbonates and chlorides of calcium and magnesium that is what actually gives hardness to water so if you are getting water for example tube well when you're getting water from tube well the water is coming from down under the ground and in many cases that water will have dissolved calcium and magnesium sulfates bicarbonates or chlorides that depends again now what does that water contain depends upon the area and the constitution of the soil and the, the ground soil. If it has got excessive amount of sulfates, then that's what the water will have. If it has got excessive amount of bicarbonates, that is what the water will have. Why? Because these mineral salts are coming from the soil only. Why? Because the water is seeping through the soil and collecting down in the rock bed. And so at this point it seeps through the soil, some of these salts dissolved in water and that's how the water became hard water. Right? Now, whether it will have calcium sulfate or magnesium sulfate or carbonate or chloride, that depends upon the constitution of the soil in that area. Right? So, but the hardness is caused because of this. Now, why is hard, hardness being caused because of this? This is because when these salts are there in water, right, when the soap, when this, when these salts are there in water, so how does water get these salts? Natural water when it flows uh, flows in rivers, seas and also groundwater when it seeps through the soil into wells dissolves these salts of calcium and magnesium soil and rocks. 
right so that is what's happening so the salts are being are dissolving in water from soil and rocks that is how these salts come into water and that's why i'm saying that it depends on where the where all the water has flown through or which kind of soil this water seep through based on that uh, the 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 constituents or the salts dissolved in water will vary all right okay now <coughs> sorry now let me let me also uh talk about why why the uh why the hard water um, can, so why the hard water cannot be used for washing clothes right that is why when you wash clothes with the, uh, this this hard water you will get these brown patches on the, the soap cloth and the cloth doesn't get uh, very clean the reason why uh, that happens is because the calcium and magnesium salts which is the sulfates chlorides and bicarbonates react with soap and it forms a white curdy substance called scum which makes washing difficult now for example in my house when i use a washing machine to wash my clothes i see the scum around the washing machine and i actually use certain uh, solutions to clean the washing machine and remove the scum right so this scum i will see the scum in the washing machine because uh, whenever I use water from the tube well, the tube well water is hard water and it's got these magnesium and calcium salts in it and that reacts with the soap, the washing powder and form this curdy substance, a white curdy substance called scum and that scum sticks onto, uh, you know, parts of the washing machine and I have to actually use certain solutions to clean the washing machine out and remove the scum out of it, right? And that is also available same thing you can see also uh, in your bathrooms the bathroom floors and the tiles will have that white covering right which forms if you're using hard water in your bathroom again the scum that is also scum because what is happening is that the salts are reacting uh, with so the, your tiles and surface and all that or and oh sorry this this is reacting and the scum is formed and scum is sticking onto your walls and glass and all that it make it makes it look very dirty but there are ways of there are solutions which are available which using which you can rub and remove the scum from the walls and so on right so that is the reason why uh, the hard water when you're using you get you don't get very clean clothes because the, the the soap reacts with um, the the salts and forms that white curdy substance right okay now what are the different types of hardness now if you look at uh, types of hardness there is temporary hardness and there is also permanent hardness right and we are going to see look at these types of hardness so if you look at bicarbonates the hardness which are formed because of bicarbonates they are temporary hardness because what we can do is we can simply boil water if the water has got bicarbonates, if you simply boil water, at that point what will happen is the bicarbonates while boiling, right, will convert. So you can see the bicarbonate is, uh, the calcium bicarbonate is getting converted, calcium carbonate, water and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide anyway will escape as bubbles, right, and calcium carbonate will, will settle down. It precipitates right, and you can simply filter that out and you get clean water. Uh, you can get soft water so if the area where you're living in the hardness is because of bicarbonate now only if you test the water you'll know right then it is very it's simply you need to just boil the water and then the bicarbonates will get converted to carbonates and the carbonates will precipitate and you can just filter out the carbonates out of the water and you get soft water Right, because carbonates, the calcium and magnesium carbonates are not soluble in water, so they will precipitate. It. So temporary hardness can be very easily removed like this. But unfortunately, in many cases, what you have is not temporary hardness. You have got permanent hardness, and the permanent hardness are caused because of the uh, sulfates and chlorides. Right, the so sulfates and chlorides, when uh, when they are there, then you kind of have to use some other agents. To remove that uh, to soften it they are called softening agents softening agents are typically things like uh, sodium carbonates right which is also called washing soda 
the washing soda can be used so you can see here the washing soda can be used to remove the hardness because of the chlorides and sulfates of calcium and magnesium and this is what really happens when you add the so washing soda into hard water what happens if it's sulfates it, it gets converted to calcium carbonate and sodium sulfate this is what is called the double uh, displacement double displacement reaction i'm sure you if you have looked at elements and compounds video you would have seen this this as an example of double displacement reaction what is the what is happening is that you can see this is going here and this is going here so this is just double displacement this goes this way and that goes this way so that's called a double displacement reaction and out of this what is happening is that you're getting sodium carbonate a uh, calcium carbonate calcium carbonate cannot dissolve water it precipitates and sodium sulfate doesn't cause hardening sodium sulfate if it is in water doesn't cause hardening hardening right so even if the water contains sodium sulfate it's still a soft it's soft water and cause doesn't create any harm if you look at magnesium chloride magnesium chloride can react with sodium carbonate and it leads to forming magnesium carbonate and sodium chloride again double displacement reaction and you know even if you have sodium chloride in water still the water is soft water right so by using washing soda which is sodium carbonate you can actually convert per, remove the permanent hardness caused due, due to magnesium or calcium sulfates or chlorides and create soft water and of course we'll require some filtering because the carbonates which are formed will precipitate so we need we will require some filtering to remove right the 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 precipitated carbonates but after that what you get the water is soft water right so i think uh, this is a this is this is the way the hardness can be removed out of water right so i think we have actually uh, discussed this this is a very important topic in fact in the domestic life uh, because hard water it cannot be we can also drink it because it's it's not good for our body hard water drinking hard water is not good for our body so we need to see how we can soften the water and then use it and it cannot be used also for cleaning washing and all that because in all those places a scum gets formed and you won't be able to clean the clothes properly and wash the vessels properly and so on so softening of water is an important thing and so and you've seen that washing soda is a very good softening agent okay good <laughs> Now, what is portable water? Have you heard what is portable? Portable water means the water which can be used for drinking. That is what is portable water, right? So, water which is fit for drinking is portable water. And so, if I take some water from a canal in a, a paddy field, is it portable? It is not. Why? Because uh, that that may have dirt, right? That may have bacteria, right? That may have algae, fungi, God knows what all. So you cannot just drink that directly. Why? Because if you drink that, you can you may feel sick, right? Because of the dirt, bacteria, and all that stuff that can actually infect you. And so it is not portable water. And if it has too much of salts inside it, that also is not good for our body. It, it can cause indigestion and a lot of issues, right? So portable water is water which is fit for drinking. And we need to have seven to eight glasses of water at least minimum per day for us to survive right okay now drinking water is not absolutely uh, absolutely poor now do you think drinking water is distilled water it is not distilled water is not portable water because water is supposed to contain certain mineral salts right so it needs because that gives it taste and that also give, make uh, and those mineral salts are inside dissolved in water is also important for water uh, for our body right so the drinking water that you drink is not absolutely pure that is what the bisleri water and the aquafina and all that they are called mineral water why because that is not distilled water is not pure water that water also contains some mineral salts which is important for our body and it also gives that nice sweet taste for that water right now now is sea water portable sea water is not portable because it contains too many too much of salts it, it contains too much of salts and that's why it's saline so you cannot consume sea water sea water right now distilled water even though it's pure doesn't require those required uh, salts so 
we cannot use that for drinking either right so the drinking water is pure water which is disinfected doesn't contain any bacteria and has got required amount of mineral salts which is important for our body that is what is portable water so sea water is not portable neither distilled water is portable why distilled water doesn't have any mineral salts at all that is also not okay sea water is too much of mineral salts that is also not okay right so it is it is it should have the right amount of mineral salts and should be disinfectant it should not have bacteria and all that stuff right that can cause problems to our body because it can infect many many infections like um, you know typhoid dysentery all these actually spread spreads through water the bacteria or virus will be inside water other other uh, example is uh, hepatitis jaundice as it's called even that actually can spread through water so all these uh, bacteria and virus could come through water and can infect your body and that is why we should always drink boiled water because while boiling many of these bacteria and viruses will get killed right and uh, uh, then you need to purify and all that and, and we'll actually look at that there's a concept of there is actually a stage in the whole water treatment plant there is a stage called chlorination where you chlorinate water and that chlorination of water will kill all these germs and bacteria in the water so that it is free from all that and you can actually uh, consume it without any worry of causing any health problems so that is portable water okay now how do you purify water now once you get water how do you purify purification as i told you has got multiple things you should remove all the dirts and impurities you should remove all the germs and bacteria right so um, and so so all there are different processes which can be used for um, you know cleaning up water so purification of water one is boiling right while boiling what happens is um, it kills all the germs in water and makes the water safe, uh, safe for drinking other thing it could do is if you have hard water there are there could be bicarbonates although bicarbonates also will get converted to carbonates and it precipitates and you can just filter and remove it so boiling can help you to also soften water based on the type of uh, hardening if it has got temporary hardness then we can actually use boiling to soften it right and it also kills all the germs inside the water the other process is chlorination right we'll actually also discuss that later on when you look at water treatment right chlorination now in chlorination what you do is you actually use bleaching powder uh, we add bleaching powder uh, a little bleaching powder to water and when you add bleaching powder to water the bleaching powder releases chlorine chlorine gas and the chlorine kills uh, the germs inside water right it actually kills germs in that water and so through this you can remove all the water borne diseases like uh, you know dysentery typhoid uh, jaundice and all these water borne diseases uh, all those uh, germs which causes those water borne diseases can be killed by chlorination and typically the way the chlorination is done is where you add bleaching powder and the bleaching powder releases chlorine into water and the chlorine will actually kill all the germs right then the other uh, important thing is to remove the impurities in water there could be you know suspended impurities like soil sand mud and all that can be removed by filtering you can use filters to remove the uh, the 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 suspended physical impurities uh, i just want to quickly show a filter here so you can see you might have seen this kind of uh, you might have seen this kind of water filters right uh, uh, you can see you might have seen these kind of water filters right now this is a water filter and inside this there are what you call the carbon filters which can filter out all the uh, impurities suspended impurities in water like small uh, you know soil mud and you know those kind of particles which are there in water can be all will all be completely filtered out so that uh, water which comes out of the filter will be will not have all those impurities right so okay fine now i want to also talk about water treatment see the water which actually comes from uh, your which is supplied by your corporation or municipality right uh, which comes into the in the tap in your in your bathroom that is basically what you call treated water right treated water it actually goes through water treatment 
and water treatment is done by water treatment plant it is actually a chemical it, it, it is it consists of multiple stages of chemical processing through which all the impurities are removed from water water is actually disinfected right and filtered and all that is done and then the net water which comes out of the water treatment plant is clean water which is pure which probably which we can drink and which is disinfected so that it doesn't have any waterborne diseases bacteria germs and all that and it is clear of all the dirt which water uh, the water in the river had for example right so typically what happens is that the water which is supplied by the municipality and corporations from a river so the river water could have germs in it could have dirt in it and so all this has to be removed and for and that is done by the water treatment plant right and we are going to see how a water treatment plant works there are multiple phases in a water treatment plant and we are going to see and for that i want to first show you a small video right which explains what are the stages in a water treatment plant Passing water through mesh screens, we remove sticks, water weeds, and other large forest. Just listen to the this video. It actually explains all the stages, right? As always, need water, but rainfall is seasonal and increasingly unpredictable. So we often use storage reservoirs to make sure there's always a supply for treatment. So this is these are all reservoirs. What you can see, this is this is what is called a reservoir, right? These are the reservoirs, and usually they are there could be natural reservoirs like lakes, or it could be man-made man man-made reservoirs. And the intent is that when the rain falls, you collect the water in these reservoirs so that it's available when there is no rain. And now the other uh, option could be to rely on a river. That is the other option. Okay, so. By passing water through mesh screens, we remove sticks, water weeds, and other large foreign objects. The air takes some odors and gas from the water and allows some dissolved metal salts to separate to be filtered out. We add air by cascading. So you can see here what is happening. Here, this is uh, this is some kind of filtering which is going on, where we are removing all the suspended impurities, big big stones and. Uh, see uh, plant, plant weeds and all that kind of stuff which will be there in the reservoir or could be there algae and all that stuff uh, or in the river so all those initially is being removed in this uh, using meshes meshes right the water down a tower spraying it into the air or bubbling air through it at this stage there are still some fine pieces of metal suspended in the water along with color and bacteria we add a precisely controlled amount of a coagulant like ferric or aluminium sulfate. Now, this is this is the next stage. So, what has happened is initially you did use some filters to uh, to kind of remove all the big stones and uh, you know those kind of big big particles which are there in the water. But they, there will be still those small suspended uh, impurities, small soil particles and all that, which which will not be removed by those filters. So what we do is we bring here, and this is actually a plant where we use things like uh, called alums, right? Alums. Now what alums does is alums actually makes all these small small particles be stick together and become bigger particles and precipitate, right? So that is what the, you can see this video. This reacts with the material in water, making it all stick together to form what's known as flock. So you can see this is what's called flocking. So we add agents into the water called alums, and what the alums will do is it'll actually react with all these materials, uh, with this suspended impurities, minute particles, and make them to stick together and called flocks, and then they will start precipitating down. Right. To make this flocculation happen, it's water flocculation. and coagulate have to be mixed together very quickly and thoroughly in a special device called a flash mixer. Next comes the clarification process. The so now 
in flocculation, what is happening is all those thin, small particles which were there in the water, which were suspended in water, they were made to stick together and uh, then they flock and then the flock say, precipitates down, right? And from and that can be removed. And uh, for that, we use these things called alums, right? Alums are the chemical uh, compounds used for flocking or flocculation. Flock forms itself into sludge and is separated in a specially designed tank called a clarifier. So here is where the flock which is formed in the last stage is being removed as sludge, right, uh, from this tank. And for that, we use certain filters. This sludge layer is called the sludge blanket. To control the blanket, sludge is periodically drained off, concentrated and removed for safe disposal. So here disposal. you can see the sludge. The sludge is floating up and that sludge is just removed. Filter, are removed by backwashing. The water now needs filtration to get rid of any remaining particles. Water is filtered slowly through very fine sand or sand-like material. For some river waters, we use ozone gas injection as a treatment stage. This can work in conjunction with GAC, or granular activated carbon treatment, where the water is filtered through carbon granules to take out any undesirable traces of largely natural... So after that, you have the soil uh, filtration using f soil bed, and then you have also filtration using carbon, carbon filter, right? And with that, all the other impurities are removed. So what all we have seen, you have seen filtration using the meshes. After that, we have seen that <coughs> you have the flocculation where you have used things like alum, where the, the, all the minute particles stick together. And uh, then after that, it is taken to a tank where the, all the, the, flock, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the particles which are formed out of flocculation is, uh, comes as sludge and the sludge is removed from the water. And then after that, you're filtering and filtering where you use soil bed and or sand bed as it's called, and also the carbon filtering, right, that is being done. Materials. The carbon in these filters is removed and regenerated by heat, so it can be used again. Now the water's filtered and thoroughly cleaned. It's disinfected to make sure no harmful bacteria remain. Now here you can see chlorination. This tank, this tank in fact has got chlorine, right? Now, now that is one way you can directly pass the chlorine gas or the other way is by using bleach, right? So that again depends on what kind of processing you want to use. So here they are actually adding chlorine gas into the water and uh, then it actually collects in a tank where it, it stays with the chlorine for some time where the chlorine will kill all the germs inside the water and disinfect it. A small controlled amount of chlorine is the most effective method and provides essential customer protection. This method is used across most of the world. In fact, sometimes the water which comes to the pipe will even smell chlorine. For effective disinfection. Last but not least, adjustments are made to the pH. So you can see all the various stages uh, which which we we can see in water treatment. Uh, in fact, right. So the different stages that you have, you basically have the uh, the 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 sedimentation tank, right. In fact, that is where you basically use the alum and uh, you know make flocculation happens and sludge is formed and is removed, right. Then you basically have the uh, the the filtration and the chlorination as all the other phases that basically is there during the water treatment. So water treatment is uh, is actually another very core part uh, which which is important in the domestic life. And the water which you get at home from the which is supplied by the corporation or municipality has got through this gone through this water treatment plant and gone through all the phases in the water treatment plant to ultimately get pure water which basically can be consumed or what you call the portable water all right so i think with this we are completing the water as a session it has been a very interesting journey i can say we actually looked at various aspects of water we uh, so just to sum up in the beginning we looked at importance of water we looked at what are the kinds of water the surface water and the ground water we have looked at 
what are the percentage of drinkable water which is available on ocean in in this planet right then uh, we looked at the sources of uh, surface water sources of ground water then uh, we looked at the uh, conservation of water rainwater harvesting properties of water like conductivity thermal conductivity and electric conductivity of water we looked at what is uh, the what do you mean by hardness what is soft water what is hard water how the temporary hard hardness can be removed permanent hardness can be removed and after that uh, we looked at what is portable water how do you purify water and we also looked at water treatment so i think uh, it was a interesting journey um, and i i hope you have understood how what what uh, how vital water is and what are the properties important properties of water and why the water conservation is so important and what are some of the ways we can conserve, conserve water what is rainwater harvesting and also how the portable water gets supplied to you uh, through water treatment and what is hardness and how you can make hard water soft thank you